come to the end of the second section here. If you remember, the first section ended in two, six and seven. His left hand is under my head, his right hand does embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field that you stir not up, nor awaken my love till he please. Chapter three begins a section which many would see as a dream sequence. It says, by night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the broad ways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me, to whom I said, saw ye him whom my soul loveth? It was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awaken my love till he please. Thank you, Father, for your word, and pray that you would indeed uh, stir up our love for you as we consider this passage, Lord, and that you would continue to strengthen us in it. We pray through Christ, amen. So in chapter three, We have the Shulamite completely smitten with love for her beloved. In verse one, it is, I sought him whom my soul loveth. There was an awareness of his absence in verse one. In verse two, I will seek him whom my soul loveth. There is a determination to seek him, to find him. In verse three, I said, saw ye him whom my soul loveth. She is engrossed in the search and she's seeking, she seeks out the help of others at that point. In verse four, I found him whom my soul loveth. So she finds him and holds him and will not let him go. And then verse five, once again, this refrain, which last time we said, because they were together in, in an embrace, the idea was to not disturb uh, my love. And we do find in this one again, they're once again in an embrace, when she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose in hinds of the field that you stir not up nor awaken my love till he please. So we have the Shulamite completely smitten with love here. By night, verse one, by night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loveth. You will have varying views on, on the section. Many do believe it is a dream sequence in which she is considering these things um, upon her bed um, that she's not yet, according to many as far as the, the chronology here, not yet in a marriage, uh, in marriage yet, but she is thinking about all these things and she is smitten with him completely and so her mind is caught up with this. This is a regular occurrence for those who are smitten with love. The pulpit commentary says the meaning may be night after night, a number of folks said that, or the plural may be used poetically for the singular. They wonder about their lover and they're consumed with thoughts about their lover. And when they lie down in the evening, it's a quiet time in which their thoughts then can collect on important matters and they review things for the day. And then when you go into a sleep, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5, a dream comes through the multitude of business. People always ask me, what do you think about dreams and what do you think about this and that? And that's always my answer. My answer is your dreams come from a multitude of business. You rework stuff in your mind. Sometimes it can be from long past. Sometimes it can be from that day. Uh, there's some sort of rebooting going on in your head. I don't know what all God does with it, 
but she seems to be in this mode as she's lying upon her bed and then um, looking for her lover who's not there. In the still of the night, her thoughts are fixed upon her beloved. Kyle and Dalich write, she was at night on her couch when a painful longing seized her. The beloved of her soul appeared to have forsaken her, to have withdrawn from her. She had lost the feeling of his nearness and was not able to recover it. Is neither here nor there, is neither here nor at Solomon 3.8 necessarily uh, the plural. The meaning may also be that this pain arising from a sense of being forgotten, always returning on her for several nights through. She became distrustful of his fidelity, perhaps, or the more she apprehended that she was no longer loved, the more ardent became her longing. She arose to seek for him who had disappeared. So in the commentaries, you'll have the, the men flit back and forth, some who think it's a dream sequence, some who think it's an actual happening. We know this, that upon the bed, David says upon the bed, when I remember thee upon my bed and I meditate on thee in the night watches. David in Psalm 63, 6 talks about the fact that in the night when things got quiet and the business of the day slowed down, that he was able then to think about the Lord and consider some things about the Lord. I find it easier in the morning when you're first awakening and everything is quiet and rested at that point to be able to think through things concerning the Lord. David said in Psalm 119, 148, my eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in your word, in your word. So she sought him whom her soul loved. She sought him, but she didn't find him. She sought him, but she didn't find him. And so she had this sense of loneliness and sense of this parting and uh, being away from him. Benson writes, when others composed themselves to sleep, my affections were working toward him. I sought him. I sought for Christ's gracious and powerful presence. I sought him. This repetition denotes her perseverance and unweariedness in seeking him but found him not, for he had withdrawn the manifestations of his love from me, either because I had not sought him diligently or I had abused his favor. So, yes, the analogy between us and the Lord is that at times we come to kind of an awakening in which we sense and realize that the Lord is not close to us like he has been perhaps at other seasons of our life. Perhaps we've been too busy with other things to spend much time with him. And suddenly we feel a separation. We don't feel as though he is near to us as he has been at other times. So I think there is that awareness sometimes that can come to us. So it is for her and her beloved, it is sometimes for us and our Lord. So. She gets this awareness of his absence. We get that too sometimes with the Lord. Verse two, then she has a determination to seek him. And that may come to us as well. Once the Lord gives us this sense of his absence, then he also grants to us this uh, urge and desire to seek him. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the broad ways, and I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, and I found him not. So she has to take action. In the, in the text, we see that she needs to take action. Her desire is burning high. Her resolve is great. Her beloved takes precedence over everything else in this text. I will seek him. Her beloved takes precedence over everything else, over her rest even because she says, I will rise now. So whether it's for real or in the dream, it's a sense of though she is upon her bed and it's supposed to be nighttime and resting, she's going to rise now. Now she's going to go because of this sense of missing him. And over her own comforts, she says, and I'm going to go about the city 
in the streets at night to go out and try to find him. And it's not a comfortable thing and for the maiden to go out into the city and to look for him, but she is driven to it. And then over time constraints, she is determined to take the search as far as necessary because she says, the sense is, if she goes about the city in the streets and can't find him, she'll go into the broadways and seek him further out as well. Kylan Delish writes, how could this night search with all the strength of love, be consistent with the modesty of a maiden. It is thus a dream which she relates. And if the beloved of her soul were a shepherd, would she seek him in the city, and not rather without in the field or a village? No, the beloved of her soul is Solomon, and in the dream, Jerusalem, his city, is transported close to the mountains of her native home. And part of Part of the disjointed nature of this text and what goes from one thing to the next is, is what makes people believe that it is a dream because in our dreams they can be very disjointed and all of a sudden you go from one thing and then you're at another thing and you don't know how you got there but it seems like it makes sense to you in the dream. Why does she go to such lengths? She's because she's searching for the one whom her soul loves. And despite her great desire and her commitment, at first she's stymied. It says she found him not. And God does not always grant success immediately. I will seek him whom my soul loveth. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown say an honest resolution is often to the doing of it like a needle that draws the thread after it. Not a mere wish that counts not the cost, to leave her easy bed and wander in the night seeking him. Because the soul of the sluggard, Solomon says, the soul of the sluggard has nothing, but the soul of the diligent will be made fat. Moses said, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, you will find him, if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And when he's charging Solomon his son, he says, Know thou the God of your father and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind for the Lord searches the hearts and understandings and all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he'll cast you off. And thus did Hezekiah throughout all of Judah, 2 Chronicles 31, and wrought what was good and right and truth before the Lord is God. And in every work, the text says, he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and the commandments to seek his God with all of his heart and he prospered. Jeremiah says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So we can take from her experience and what she has done in this desire for her beloved, how we ought to seek the Lord too. He should take precedence over other things, sometimes even over our rest. I will rise now. Sometimes over our comforts, I will go about the city and streets, over time constraints, determined to take the search as far as is necessary to be near the Lord again, and that we can have that close communion that we have experienced in times past. The promise of the scripture is, is that if we will seek him, Truly, he will be found. The third verse, the first verse is, I sought him whom my soul loves, this awareness of his absence. The second verse was, I will seek him whom my soul loves, this determination to seek him and find him. The third verse was when she's talking to the watchman and she says, did you see the one whom my soul loves? She's engrossed with this search and when she meets up with the watchman, completely engrossed. Because of the overwhelming power of her beloved's love, she imagines everyone should understand her consternation, everyone should help her with her problem, everyone should sympathize, all should be seeking him as she is seeking him. The watchmen don't give an answer that helps, apparently. And when the soul is in distress over the absence of Christ, Ministers or watchmen can only do so much. They can point a soul to Christ. They can tell them what the means of grace are. 
But they can't necessarily bring the two together because that soul has to find Christ for itself. The minister can preach what he can preach and he can counsel what he can counsel. Some ministers may be ill-fitted to help an inquirer if they're not spiritual men themselves. And some will give excellent advice if followed and if understood. And it says in the text, the watchmen that go about the city found me, they found me. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown say, the general ministry of the word finds individual souls in their quest for Jesus Christ. The watchmen found me. So, because that's what the watchmen are supposed to be doing, that's what the ministers are supposed to be doing, is leading men to Christ and pointing men to Christ. And so if any men are seeking Christ, the word will find them. You remember when Isaac was, uh, or Eleazar was going for a bride for Isaac. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not left me destitute of mercy and truth, I being in the way the Lord led me. I being in the way, and this is where she's at right now in this whole process, she is in the way. She has become aware of the absence of the Lord. She decides that she must seek him, and now she is completely engrossed in the search. So much so that it's a beautiful picture. You see her out in the streets. So you see this maiden out in the streets, the watchmen who are out in the, out in the city, uh, taking care of the city at night. She comes up to them all in, a, all in a flurry and just says, where is he? Where is he? The one whom my soul loves. She is so engrossed with it herself, she expects them to understand everything she's saying about it, even though she gives them almost no details. But that just shows how intense her search was at that point, how engrossed she was in the whole thing. Dr. Gill, in making the analogy to Christ, said, did you see him whom my soul loves? Meaning Christ, who was still the object of her love and the uppermost in her thoughts, whom she thus describes, without mentioning his name, as if he was the only him in the world worthy of any regard. So it was for this Shulamite and her lover, he's the only one that she can think of. She doesn't have to name him. And so it is for the saints in Christ, which shows how much he was in her mind, how much the desires and affections of her soul were toward him, that these ministers needed no other description of him. So that would be certainly the goal for the saint, to be so engrossed with the Lord that our mind would be that here is the one who is preeminent, here is the one who is most important. The Cambridge Bible writes, it is in the very nature of a dream also that these things quickly follow one another without fixed liniments. This also having gone out by night, she found in the street him whom she sought is a happy combination of circumstances formed in the dreaming soul, an occurrence without probable external reality, although not without deep inner truth. Because the fourth verse she is aware of his absence. She's determined to seek him. She's engrossed in this search. And then she finds him. I found him whom my soul loves. If it is a dream, they don't always turn out like that. That well, do they? Sometimes they're very disappointing. Sometimes you're happy to be done with the dream. I found him whom my soul loveth. It was but a little that I passed from them, from the watchman, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him, I would not let him go, until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. So they moved from the streets of the city suddenly to the Shulamite's home. And this is why many believe it's the dream. As love would have in the kind providence of God, she just stumbles upon him suddenly. So providence has helped us so many times. I held him, the Hebrew word means to seize someone and to hold them in possession and would not let them go or in the Hebrew, he would not slacken the grip. 
I seized him. I took him as my possession. I would not slacken the grip until I brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. So she dreams that she takes him to live with her, that he might never leave her and that he might dwell with her forever. In this familial, familial setting, in this setting which she has the fondest remembrances of, which is her mother's home and even in the chamber in which she was conceived, which is a kind of romantic ideal. The pulpit commentary writes, the modesty of the last clause is very beautiful. The mother would, of course, at that time, be in her sleeping chamber. There alone would the maiden receive her lover at such a time. The mother would gladly welcome the young man, and thus the love which Shulamite declares is set upon the ground of perfect chastity and homely purity. The object of this little episode introduced by the bride into her song as she lies in the arms of Solomon is to show that, ecstatic and intense as her devotion is, it's not the lawless affection of a concubine but the love of a noble wife. The religious emotions are always presented to us in scripture, not as wild fanaticism or superficial excitement, but as a pure offering of the heart which blends with the highest relations and interests of human life and sanctifies home and country with all their ties and obligations. The mother and the child are one in the new atmosphere of bridal joy. No religion is worthy of the name which does not bring its object into the chamber of her who conceived us. We love all that are bound with us in life, not the less, but the more, because we love Christ supremely. We revere all that is just and holy in the common world, the more, not the less, because we worship God and serve the Lord. What a rebuke to asceticism or monasticism or all unsocial religion. So it was a little I passed from them and I found him whom my soul loveth. And it is a good thing when the Lord allows us to find him again, when he comes to us, when we renew fellowship with him once again. And then we want to hold him and not let him go. We want to seize him. We want to seize that stronger communion, that greater affection that we had and that we had lost. We don't want to let it go again. But it shows the vicissitudes of life, both for this lover and her beloved, and the vicissitudes of the Christian life too, where sometimes we're close to the Lord and then we're not, and then we need to seek him again with all our hearts and and then he gives us intimations of his love when we're studying his word or praying or fellowshipping with the saints or in some fashion he comes to us. It could be in the communion service, it could be in a baptismal service, it could be in a preaching service, but he comes to us and we sense once again the fellowship that we have with him. And so she says now once again that she is with him and they are in each other's embrace in this dream. I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the rows and hinds of the field, stir not up my, stir not up or awaken my love until he please. Don't disturb him. Don't disturb this love that I have. This happy ending to the end of this dream, the peace and oneness that we have here. Gill once again writes, I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem which are either the words of Christ adjuring the young converts not to disturb the church, who had now Christ in her arms, taking repose with him, being wearied with running about in search of him, or they are the words of the church, who, having experienced the long absence of Christ and having been at much pains in search of him, now had found him, was very unwilling to part with him, and fearing these young converts should by any unbecoming word or action provoke him to depart, she gives them a solemn charge. Stir not up or awaken my love till he please. And, and so it is the difficulty of those who have gone through the anomaly of revival, where revival hardly ever comes on the earth. Every now and then it will come and sometimes in a great sweeping way bring a lot of people into the kingdom. We read of these 
different ones in history, but they're not every day, and they're not every year, and they're not every decade, or even a century sometimes. But they, 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 they are here and there throughout the world. But those who have been in those have a difficult time after that because they have experienced such closeness to the Lord, they're always wanting to have that again. And they don't always get that for the rest of their life sometimes because it's such an anomaly. But I think that the song does encourage us if we sense that the presence of the Lord is not with us like it's been in any time past, that there is a remedy to that, that there is a seeking, there is getting ourselves engrossed once again in the preeminence of Christ and, uh, and that those who seek me will find me and that he's kind and he's good to us to show us you know, his affection and aspects of his love to us as we use the means of grace that are all about us. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that you would indeed help us, O oh Lord, uh, to mortify the deeds of the flesh, which are those things which keep us from you, because we know that sin separates us from you, and that you would strengthen us in the spirit, and that spirit of God which you have granted to us, O oh Lord, and renewed our spirits with. We pray that you would help us uh, to walk in the Spirit, not fulfill the deeds of the flesh, not grieve the Spirit, not quench the Spirit, but indeed be filled with the Spirit, be immersed in the Spirit, be, in order that we might uh, know a close communion with Thee. We thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Uh, strengthen us by it, Lord. Help each one of us in our own walk with You uh, to be able to experience uh, in our Christian walk that closeness to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.